Manuel Antonio Rodolfo Quinoxica, better known by his stage name Anthony Quinn, was an American actor. Wikipedia. Born, April, the 21st, 1915, Chihuahua, Mexico. Died, June, the 3rd, 2001, age 86 years, Boston, Massachusetts, United States. Children, Francesco Quinn, Lorenzo Quinn, Danny Quinn, Moore. Spouse, Kathy Benvin. M. 1997-2001, Jolanda Delori, M. 1966-1997, Catherine Demili, M. 1937-1965, Education, Hamill Street Elementary School, Stella Adler Studio of Acting, Polytechnic Senior High School, Belmont High School, Parents, Manuela Oxica, Francisco Quinn, Anthony Quinn was born Antonio Rodolfo Quinoxica. Some sources indicate Manuel Antonio Rodolfo Quinoxica, on April 21, 1915, in Chihuahua, Mexico, to Manuela, Oxica, and Francisco Quinn, who became an assistant cameraman at a Los Angeles, CIA film studio. His paternal grandfather was Irish, and the rest of his family was Mexican. After starting life in extremely modest circumstances in Mexico, his family moved to Los Angeles, where he grew up in the Boyle Heights and Echo Park neighborhoods. He played in the band of evangelist Amy Semple McPherson as a youth and as a deputy preacher. He attended Polytechnic High School and later Belmont High, but eventually dropped out. The young Quinn boxed, which stood him in good stead as a stage actor, when he played Stanley Kowalski in A Streetcar Named Desire to rave reviews in Chicago, then later studied architecture under Frank Lloyd Wright at the Great Architect Studio, Taliesin, in Arizona, Quinn was close to Wright, who encouraged him when he decided to give acting a try, made his credited film debut in Parole 1936. After a brief apprenticeship on stage, Quinn hit Hollywood in 1936 and picked up a variety of small roles in several films at Paramount, including An Indian Warrior in The Plainsman, 1936, which was directed by the man, who later became his father-in-law, Cecil B. DeMille. As a contract player at Paramount, Quinn's roles were mainly ethnic types, such as an Arab chieftain in the Bing Crosby Bob Hope comedy, Road to Morocco, 1942. As a Mexican national, he did not become an American citizen, until 1947, he was exempt from the draft. With many other actors in military service during WWII, he was able to move up into better supporting roles. He married Demi's daughter Catherine Demille, which afforded him entrance to the top circles of Hollywood society. He became disenchanted with his career and did not renew his Paramount contract despite the advice of others, including his father-in-law, with whom he did not get along, whom Quinn reportedly felt had never accepted him due to his Mexican roots. The two men were also on opposite ends of the political spectrum, but they eventually were able to develop a civil relationship. Quinn returned to the stage to hone his craft. His portrayal of Stanley Kowalski in A Streetcar Named Desire in Chicago and on Broadway where he replaced the legendary Marlon Brando, who is forever associated with the role, made his reputation and boosted his film career when he returned to the movies. Brando and Elia Kazan, who directed Streetcar on Broadway and on film, A Streetcar Named Desire, 1951, were crucial to Quinn's future success. Kazan, knowing the two, were potential rivals due to their acclaimed portrayals of Kowalski cast Quinn as Brando's brother in his biographical film of Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata, Viva Zapata 1952. Quinn won the Best Supporting Actor Academy Award for 1952, making him the first Mexican-American to win an Oscar. It was not to be his lone appearance in the winner's circle. He won his second Supporting Actor Oscar in 1957 for his portrayal of Paul Gogwin in Vincente Minnelli's biographical film of Vincent van Gogh, Lust for Life. 1956, opposite Kirk Douglas. Over the next decade Quinn lived in Italy and became a major figure in world cinema, as many studios shot films in Italy to take advantage of the lower costs, runaway production, had battered the industry since its beginnings in the New York, New Jersey area in the 1910s. He appeared in several Italian films, giving one of his greatest performances as the circus strongman, who brutalizes the sweet soul played by Giulietta Massina, in her husband Federico Fellini's masterpiece The Road, 1954, he met his second wife, Jolanda Adalori, a wardrobe assistant, 
while he was in Rome filming Barabbas, 1961. Alternating between Europe and Hollywood, Quinn built his reputation and entered the front rank of character actors and character leads. He received his third Oscar nomination, and first for Best Actor, for George Cukor's Wild as the Wind, 1957. He played a Greek resistance fighter against the Nazi occupation, in The Monster Hit the Guns of Navarone, 1961, and received kudos for his portrayal of a once great boxer, on his way down in Rod Serling's Requiem for a Heavyweight, 1962. He went back to playing ethnic roles, such as an Arab warlord in David Lean's masterpiece Lawrence of Arabia, 1962, and he played the eponymous lead, in the Sword and Sandal, Blockbuster Barabbas, 1961. Two years later, he reached the zenith of his career, playing Zorba the Greek in the film of the same name, Achaea Zorba the Greek, 1964, which brought him his fourth, and last, Oscar nomination as Best Actor. The 1960s were kind to him, he played character leads in such major films, as The Shoes of the Fisherman, 1968, and The Secret of Santa Vittoria, 1969. However, his appearance in the title role in the film adaptation of John Fowle's novel, The Magus, 1968, did nothing to save the film, which was one of that decade's notorious turkeys. In the 1960s, Quinn told Life magazine that he would fight against typecasting. Unfortunately, the following decade saw him slip back into playing ethnic types again, in such critical bombs as the Greek. The following decade saw him slip back into playing ethnic types again, in such critical bombs as the Greek tycoon, 1978. He starred as the Hispanic mayor of a southwestern city, on the short-lived television series The Man and the City, 1971, but his career lost its momentum during the 1970s. Aside from playing a thinly disguised Aristotle Onassis, in the cinematic Roman a cleft the Greek tycoon, 1978. His other major roles of the decade were as Hamza in the controversial The Message, 1976, Achaea, Mohammed, Messenger of God, as the Italian patriarch in The Inheritance, 1976, yet another Arab in Caravans, 1978, and as a Mexican patriarch in The Children of Sanchez, 1978. In 1983, he reprised his most famous role, Zorba the Greek on Broadway in the revival of the musical Zorba, for 360 to performances, opposite Leela Kedrova, who had also appeared in the film, and won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress for her performance. His career slowed during the 1990s, but he continued to work steadily in films and television, including an appearance with frequent film co-star Maureen O'Hara in Only the Lonely, 1991. Quinn lived out the latter years of his life in Bristol, Rhode Island, where he spent most of his time painting and sculpting. Beginning in 1982, he held numerous major exhibitions in cities such as Vienna, Paris, and Seoul. He died in a hospital in Boston at age 86 from pneumonia and respiratory failure, linked to his battle with throat cancer. Family Spouses Kathy Benvin, December 7, 1997, June, the 3rd, 2001, his death, two children, Jolanda Adalori, January, the 2nd, 1966, August, the 19th, 1997, divorced, three children, Catherine Demili, October, the 3rd, 1937, January, the 21st, 1965, divorced, five children, children, Antonia Patricia Rose Quinn, Lorenzo Quinn, Francesco Quinn, Ryan Quinn, parents, Francisco Quinn, Manuela Oxica, trademarks, rich, smooth voice, multi-ethnic roles, especially on stage and in films. Trivia Donated blood to John Barrymore, whenever the older actor needed a transfusion, was very fond of Keanu Reeves. They became friends during the filming of A Walk in the Clouds, 1995. Anthony Quinn was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, in 1915, during the Mexican Revolution, in which his father was allegedly a soldier in the Army of Mexican Revolutionary Pancho Villa. After the Revolution, the family moved to Los Angeles, California, where Quinn's father eventually secured a job as a cameraman at Selig Film Studios. Quinn often accompanied his father to work, and became acquainted with such stars as Tom Mix and John Barrymore, with whom he kept up the friendship into adulthood. Quinn's first job in Hollywood was tending animals at the Selig studio. Quinn's father died when Anthony was nine years old. He grew up in East Los Angeles, 
shining shoes and selling newspapers. For extra cash, he entered dance contests and sold the statues he won. Had five children, Christopher Quinn, born October the 27, 1938, died March the 15, 1941. Christina Quinn, born December the 1, 1941. Catalina Quinn, born November the 21st, 1942. Duncan Quinn, born August the 4th, 1945. And Valentina Quinn, born December the 26th, 1952, with Catherine Demille. Had three children, Francesco Quinn, born March the 22nd, 1963, died August the 5th, 2011, Danny Quinn, born April the 16th, 1964, and Lorenzo Quinn, born May the 7th, 1966, with Jolanda Dalori. Had two children, Sean Quinn, born February the 7th, 1973, and Alexa Quinn, born December the 30th, 1976, with Friedel Dunbar and had two children, Antonia Quinn, born July the 23rd, 1993, and Ryan Quinn, born July the 5th, 1996, with Kathy Benvin, was good friends with actress Maureen O'Hara, they starred together six times, the films are The Black Swan, 1942, Buffalo Bill, 1944, Sinbad, The Sailor, 1947, Against All Flags, 1952, The Magnificent Matador, 1955, and Only the Lonely, 1991. Quotes. In Europe, an actor is an artist. In Hollywood, if he isn't working, he's a bum. When asked about his ethnicity, it doesn't make a difference as long as I'm a person in the world. I never get the girl. I wind up with a country instead. They said all I was good for was playing Indians. I can't retire. I mean, I started working when I was a year and a half old, and I worked all my life. In the 1980s, I don't see many men today. I see a lot of guys running around on television with small waists, but I don't see many men. I never satisfied that kid, referring to himself. But I think he and I have made a deal now. It's like climbing a mountain. I didn't take him up Mount Everest, but I took him up Mount Whitney. And I think that's not bad. I have lived in a flurry of images, but I will go out in a freeze frame. On Ingrid Bergman, I reckon there wasn't a man who came within a mile of her who didn't fall in love with her. On Marlon Brando, I admire Marlon's talent, but I don't envy the pain that created it. On Marilyn Monroe, an empty-headed blonde with a fat rear. Oh, Monroe was pretty enough to look at, but there were hundreds of better-looking actresses poking around Hollywood. Even after she hit the big time, with gentlemen prefer blondes, 1953, I never could see what all the fuss was about. On Zorba the Greek, 1964, nobody wanted to do this role. Burl Ives and Burt Lancaster turned it down. They said, who cares about an old man making love to a broken down old broad? In 1962, ten years ago, there wasn't an actor who didn't envy Brando. He was superb. His potential was enormous. But what happened? He went out to Hollywood and instead of fighting giants, he fought pygmies. He stopped growing. He threw his potential away. On Spencer Tracy, Spencer Tracy's a dangerous actor. You never know what he's going to do. He's one of the few actors you can never steal a scene from. He and Olivier and Jean Gabin. When I was just starting in movies, I got a reputation for being a scene stealer. Once I was in a film with a famous star and had to stand behind him in one scene. Now watch that Quinn, this star told the director. I don't want him stealing the scene behind my back. The director parked me in a chair and I just sat there. Next day, when we were looking at the rushes, the star said, See, I told you, look at him. The director exclaimed, But he's only sitting there. Only, rejoined the star, Maybe so, but he's thinking. On Marlon Brando, we forget how he revolutionized acting. Look at the chances he takes, think of all the stars who drift along playing themselves. In 1996, the painter leaves his mark. And I just put into statues in Rhode Island, that I'm working on. And I think that's going to make me last longer than me. I mean, who remembers? Zorba. Nobody remembers. Zorba. Nobody remembers. Requiem for a heavyweight. One of the reasons I did all the Greeks and Arab parts I did was because I was trying to identify myself as a man of the world. I lived in Greece, in France, Iran and all over the world, Spain, trying to find a niche where I would finally be accepted. My mother and father were both young kids fighting in the revolution, and we always lived a Mexican life, even when we moved to Texas. But to be Mexicans with the name of Quinn, that was not a nice thing to do. If your name isn't Gonzalez or Montoya or whatever, they just don't acknowledge you as a Mexican.
I think I'm lucky. I was born with very little talent but great drive. I am of the opinion, and I'm not afraid to say it, that men are slightly lost today. They don't know where in the hell they are with this women's liberation. A man is responsibility. I think that's what I represent, responsibility. The size of the actor makes a difference. I'm six feet two and I look at life a lot different from a man who is five feet three or ten. The parts dried up as I reached my 60th birthday, loosely coinciding with my growing disinclination to pursue them. Indeed, I could not see the point in playing old men on screen when I rejected the role for myself. I held out my arms in a traditional Greek stance and shuffled along the sands. Soon Alan Bates picked up on the move. We were born again Greeks, joyously celebrating life. We had no idea what we were doing, but it felt right and good. On The Brave Bulls, 1951, the supporting cast was entirely Mexican, and I was thrilled to be in such company. After so many years as the token Latin on the set, I found tremendous security in numbers. For the first time, I belonged. It took the faith of 750 million Muslims to restore my faith in myself. On his early film roles, I was the bad guy's bad guy. I rarely made it to the final reel without being dispatched by a gun or a knife or a length of twine, typically administered by a rival hood. Some days, I paint like an Indian. Some days, I paint like a Mexican. I steal from everybody, Picasso, Kandinsky. I steal, but only from the best. Probably it's the Irish in me that makes me speak out. But there are about 800 boys in my profession who have a political ideal and want to express it. How can an actor be real in his work if he hasn't some convictions regarding the problems in the world around him? Funny thing, you know, one of my favorite characters in all my films was Zorba the Greek. And somehow, I think I've become more like Zorba ever since I played him. Many people remember Jack Barrymore as either a wit or a drunk, but what impressed me was his courage of conviction. He used to tell me that you can only be as right as you dare to be wrong, that you must be willing to take chances to achieve superiority in your craft. He gave me his armor from Richard III. He was like a retiring matador, who gives his sword to the most promising newcomer he knows. I love, love, love women. I fought early to go beyond the stereotypes and demand Mexicans, and Indians be treated with dignity in films. You know, the character in The Oxbow Incident was the most influential depiction of a Mexican for its time. He was a young outlaw but a young outlaw who spoke eight languages. Those were rough times, right from the beginning. With a name like Quinn, I wasn't totally accepted by the Mexican community in those days, and as a Mexican I wasn't accepted as an American. So as a kid I just decided, well, a plague on both your houses. I'll just become a world citizen. So that's what I did. Acting is my nationality. On his painting style, I guess you'd just have to call it Mexican abstract. I don't really think about it. I just do it. I don't know. I was born in a revolutionary era. So maybe that's why I've always been sort of a revolutionary figure. I steal from everyone. Picasso did it. Modigliani did it. So did Da Vinci. Rufino Tamayo stole from the Mayan civilization. The thing is, a big talent steals a small talent borrows. I have never, never, never talked about my son's death. I've never used the term death in connection with my son. But every night doing the show I had to say, he's dead. At first I cut the line out of the play. The director came to me and said, it's wrong. I know how painful it is, but you'll have to do it. He loved his son very much, this Zorba. He left his family because he couldn't bear being with them after the loss of his son. Zorba and I are very much alike. My father, Francesco, had the same problem I did with people making fun of him because of his name, and he joined the revolution to prove that he was a good Mexican, but I must say that I think it was a good thing, if there is such a thing as a good thing, that I wasn't accepted 100% by the Mexican people, because it drove me mad, it drove me absolutely crazy, I live a revolutionary life, I believe in karma, one is guided by le duent, a worm inside your stomach that makes you do all sorts of things, this worm, no matter what you do, how you try to change, this duend calls the shots. When I die I want to return and claim my six feet of Mexican soil. It's my way of saying, accept me. If I go back maybe then they will say, he was one of us. I've never accepted discrimination against myself. I've always walked proudly, maybe too much so, never apologizing for being Mexican. If I stayed in Hollywood, I'd still be playing Indians. I went on stage, where I had the chance to play many nationalities. I was an English king, a Polish worker in, streetcar taking over the role from Brando. I hope I opened the door for ethnic leading men. Many Mexican actors didn't reach out to play other nationalities, other roles, but now they can. I'm sorry to say my home country never really accepted me as Mexican. 
If I had a Mexican name and won to Oscars, I'd be a god to Mexicans everywhere. But I've never been taken up as anyone's hero. They don't know whether to treat me as Mexican or Irish because of my name. At that time Hollywood, hell, America, looked down on anybody not blonde or blue-eyed as potential enemies. We all had to put up with it. I always said I was Mexican, Indian and Irish. The only Mexican leading man was Gilbert Rowland, but he told everyone he was Spanish. For so many years I defied Mexico, angry for not recognizing me. I had no backing. I'm no longer angry or disappointed. I made my own life out of defiance and I'm proud of it. A career in pictures did not look promising. I was either too dark, or too Mexican, or too unusual looking, and the good parts always seemed to go to the actors, who fit a more conventional mold.